Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. Wow. This time of year is such an important time of year for so many people. I mean, every time of year is an important time for so many people. But we get near this time of year, especially, and some things in people's minds start sort of, they start thinking a little bit more heavily about different things. And of course, one thing that's very important in the world today is to make sure that we are there ready to help people that really need help. And of course, you know, one thing that's on all the shows, we talk about it on our show, you can't go on TV or radio or you know, you can't read a newspaper. If you even read an old fashioned newspaper anymore, go online without talking about drug and alcohol abuse. And it's, it's so prevalent. We thought it would be a real interesting interview to bring a real leader in drug and alcohol treatment on the show. His name is Mr. Vern Johnson. He, of course, is the owner of Axiom Care. And for people that really are ready to begin a different type of a journey, a new journey, the first step to recovery. You know, Axiom Care really is a leader in the space. They're in the Arizona marketplace, of course, but they become really known as the company or the organization, or more importantly, the people that are really committed provide, to provide the best possible care that's really available. So Vern, it's an honor to have you on the show. I look forward to getting into it with you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. We're very excited to be here today. Yeah, I mean, it's such an important need. It's such an important subject, such an important topic. But before we get into it and talk about it all, because we have so many questions, especially from people that watch the show that said, hey, you know, Andy, when you get someone of this type of expertise on the show, make sure you ask these types of questions. Let's pull the lens back to 30,000 feet. Tell us about Axiom Care, and then we'll get into it. Yeah, yeah. So we, we started Axiom Care about 10 years ago as a small sober living program and um, expanded over the years. Currently, we're at about 150 beds, and we've expanded our, our product line to include detox, which is a medical intervention for folks who are coming down from opioid um, and other alcohol and drugs. Um, then moving into our residential treatment programs, where folks spend mostly 30 to 45 days in that program. Detox is usually five to seven days. And then move into our outpatient programs, where they may be um, involved for three to six months after that, as they reintegrate back into the community, we want to support them in that. We also work very closely with the justice system here in Arizona. We have some specialty programs that the state has put together for us for folks to divert them from going to prison and helping them as they come out of prison with drug and alcohol programs. And we have a, a hundred beds of a 90 day program for that population also. So, and that we've been doing for about eight years now. Yeah, you've been doing it for eight years. Great results. Of course, you started as a so social worker. And of course, you devoted over 25 years of your life to healthcare. You know, throughout your career, you've consulted for many years to develop and implement a new business concept for 17 hospice and home care startups. I mean, you've really committed your entire life to helping people and put things in place to help people have building blocks, really to be, you know, to put them on the path to, you know, be becoming part of society in a meaningful way. Let's talk about it. We hear about it all the time, Vern. What's going on out there? Why does there seem to be more drug and alcohol abuse than ever before? Well, we have a, a fentanyl epidemic that has come along with the opioid epidemic. Fentanyl is a very cheap, available drug. And it is, it can be very fatal. We've seen our overdoses in the United States raise in the last 12 months to 109,000 deaths. And, you know, that's a lot of people struggling out there. And so it's, it's been a battle. It's been an uphill battle. You know, first of all, finding sources of reimbursement. But we have been able to work with our state and with the Medicaid system and our clients are really, um, we can provide care regardless of ability to pay through grants we have, through the contracts we have through Medicaid. And that's really our wheelhouse is folks who can't go to 
other programs or have availability, but there's still just a huge lack of bed space because in order to open a treatment center, you have to have a building. And in order to have the building, then you have to have the licensure and the reimbursement and all those pieces. And it's a, it's a very long, complicated, difficult process, but I feel like now we're finally at a place where we have those relationships, where we can expand. We have a new 84 bed facility just about to come out of the ground in Pinal County, which has a very high um, uh, use of opioids and fentanyl and have a lot of needs there. And um, the company, you know, we really strong, we really stand strongly behind our values, which is dignity, empathy, and integrity. And we feel if we can provide those three things to our staff and our clients, it's going to really give us a head start in providing those services. Yeah, I love it. Dignity, empathy, and integrity. Integrity. I mean, that's what you become known for. I mean, you've got the three locations, you're opening another one. You really care about the people, and I love it so much. Let's talk about the fentanyl. You know, we, we hear about it all the time. You mentioned that it's part of the opioid, opioid, or opioid you know, problem out there. Pardon me for mispronouncing that. Yeah, yeah. How do we help these people that get into this um, cycle yeah. of, of pain and, and, and going chasing the dragon, you know, that's what they used to use. I think the word for heroin and, and opiates yeah. and of course the fentanyl. Yeah. Well, and, and I think part of it is for the person to be ready to accept care because we can't force care on somebody, right? That just doesn't work, but making it available. So some of the things that we do that are creative, when someone calls us and there are say maybe 20 miles, Phoenix is a huge city, right? Maybe they're 20 or 30 miles from our facility. We send an Uber right to them. There's an Uber coming to you, pick you up, bring you over here. Because when someone's ready for treatment, they have to be ready. We get them in and then we figure out how we're going to pay for it. As opposed to many facilities that are very concerned about, okay, you only fit in this box, you only fit in that box. We just say, come, we'll come get you. And uh, if you're ready... We're here for you. Wow. I love it. It's such a refreshing look. You have so, so many great success stories. Let's talk, Vern, about socioeconomic impact. In other words, you know, for the people watching the show, I'd like for you to touch on who does this affect? Because in my mind, almost every family, no, ma no matter no. where you're at along sort of the socioeconomic spectrum, has someone in their family, knows somebody who's in their family or three degrees of separation that knows someone that's been impacted well, negatively by this? That's a very good question because when I first started um, in this particular business, I was, uh, I've always been in the healthcare business, but in this particular business 10 years ago, it seemed to be there was two or three degrees of separation, right? So every talk to, to they said, okay, well, my, my nephew-in-law or my friend's friend, but I feel now it's one degree of separation. When I'm in an airport, and I'm talking to people and they ask me what I do. They say, oh, my gosh, my sister. Oh, my son. And I, and I feel like the, the, it's just growing and, and, and nearly everybody's infected by it. And when you talk about the social piece, I mean, homelessness is a direct result of drug and alcohol abuse. Um, and... Um, and that's a big issue for a lot of people in our state and in many of the Western and the whole country. I mean, you go to cities and you see things that you never thought you'd see. Um, and so, but it comes back to beds, you know, how, how much can we, can, how much can we help people? And, and this being dot-com magazine, I do want to touch on our technology because I feel that that's important. You know, one is the use of the Ubers and the, the ability for us to text with people, connect with people, utilizing our websites, creating points of entry. You know, we are just looking at some statistics about 35% of our clients come from someone word of mouth who is saying, here we are. Um, also, we use Power BI with Microsoft and we've been able to really analyze our referral patterns, our discharge patterns, 
What's going on with our clients? Why do they leave early? Is there a pattern? Um, we even drilled down to, um, we had a situation with people leaving the program and we drilled it down to a certain nurse on a certain shift who was having a hard time with the clients and utilizing that data to be able to do that. Um, the other thing is we've gone completely paperless. And so we, are, we have a digital EMR that um, is, is really making a, a big difference for us um, to be able to manage. And we also have mastered Meister task. And I say mastered, I may not have mastered it as well as the staff has, but um, to really create projects and follow through and, and be done. And, and I have to comment, I was at an event for our new governor uh, on Tuesday, um, Governor Hobbs, and um, you know, a, a, a lot of people were talking about um, you know, the needs out there in the community and what's going on and how difficult it is to fill beds. Um, and and we, we hope that Arizona is on the forefront of what's going on. And we hope that you know, we're always willing to talk to other folks around the country who have different ideas and moving this ahead. And, and I think we're at a very exciting time to really empower people and inspire change. And that's one of our credos also, we call it EPIC, empower people and inspire change. Yeah, it's great, of course. And you mentioned your staff. I think we should probably talk about your staff. I mean, at Axiom Care, I mean, you're known for really looking for the best of the best, the people that really have integrity, that have a value system that's in line with your corporate culture and your leadership sort of values. Let's talk about how important your staff is to yeah. the success of uh, Axiom Care. Well, we've been blessed with a, a leadership team that is just phenomenal. We were on a leadership retreat a few weeks ago, and and it's just unbelievable the talent we have here because I believe a lot of our people are very committed because of personal situations and family situations in, in the um, uh, chemical dependency world. Um, one of the other things that came up in Governor Hobbs sort of state of the state was so many healthcare providers are having a hard time finding staff. And we're actually fully staffed right now. And I there was a couple new employees coming on board this morning that I sat with and, and asked them about us. And the one guy says, you know, I'm a graduate. I graduated from your program two years ago and I want to come back and help people. And that's the best employee I can ever find because they can relate and they can work directly with those people. And they're an example to those, to those clients. Wow. I've been through it and I'm here for you. And now I work here and I have a good career. Yeah. It's great. You know, your team and the leadership team, I mean, you offer powerful, substantial programming to really, you know, individ individuals that really need this the most. And you, you know, you build on personal accountability and I would imagine managing their emotions is very important. And then finding what I would call pro-social alternatives to really increase their sense of community is very important as well. When we think about the justice system, because you mentioned this, Vern, mm -hmm. for the people that you know, are in sort of the revolving door of the justice system, how many of them are really being impacted by drug and alcohol abuse? Well, uh, the people at Department of Correction, and I'm, not, I'm just going to say what they say is 90% of them you know, have been put into the system and back and forth. But I want to talk about one of the strongest things that happens with our folks is when they get that job. When they get that job, you'd be surprised at how many 35-year-olds have never had a real job, never had a, had a checking account, never had their own apartment. And, and they come in the program and they get that first job and they walk in the door with their first paycheck. It's just like the most life-changing thing. They have a purpose and they have a cause and getting them that first job is so, so important. Yeah, I love that. Let's talk about that a little bit because employers, whether it's in Phoenix or you know Scottsdale, Mesa, wherever you are in that area and throughout the country and the world, mm -hmm. there are employers that have doubts about hiring people from the justice system sort of revolving door into their environment. So 
for the people watching the show, I want to give you a chance to sort of change their mind, change their outlook, change their position. I think people have to remember that these people are sober. They're not in their disease. They're not in their disease now. They're sober. They're rebuilding their lives. And we have found some great employers here in the Valley, Amazon being one of them. A lot of our people work for Amazon in their warehouses and in their delivery uh, the food industry for our women. Our women find many good opportunities in the food industry um, and construction. Many of our clients have very strong construction skills. And Governor Ducey, um, who is currently our governor, has created some very innovative programs to work with employers and train and educate folks as they're exiting prison. And then they come and they live with us and we help them kind of get started, get on that path. And um, um, that's the most important thing is employment because, you know, gives you a purpose. Yeah, I love it. And of course, you mentioned using technology, the high touch, high tech, using Uber. I mean, I love it. Someone has a problem, you send them on an Uber, you bring them in, you figure out how they're going to pay later. I mean, it's beautiful. And of course, Fern, you mentioned a lot of politicians and you're very integral in having these politicians come to you to sort of say, hey, Vern, you know, what are you thinking about this idea? Let's run some things through you and vice versa. How important is it for you to be involved with decision makers like that for the advantage of not only Axiom, but the people that need the help? Well, I think it's, I think it's important. We have, you know, we have to really, you know, I like to use example. I worked in the hospice industry for many years and I started when I was very young. I was 10. (laughs) <laughs> but um, hospice had just started when I first got in the industry. Nobody knew what the word hospice was, right? But now everybody knows what hospice is. And this is 25 years ago, right? Everybody knows what hospice is. Everyone knows hospice can save money, can give people a better process, help them be at home, support them, all those sorts of things. We need to do that with drug and alcohol treatment. We need to take this conversation from right here to the dinner table and for it to reduce the stigma, right? Because people are considered to be less than, not worthy because they have a drug and alcohol problem. But people don't understand that this is a disease process. This is a disease process, just like people have diabetes, just like people have cancer. This is a disease process that you just can't take a pill for. I mean, there are some great new medications that we use with our clients, Suboxone, Vivitrol, that help them with this journey, but it's not going to cure them, (laughs) right? They have to do this themselves. So how do we as a society really, really destigmatize the need for drug and alcohol treatment? That's the journey. And I think politicians, people in the media, and just everybody around the dinner table. How do we get this conversation started? How do we normalize this? And that I think is gonna be the big societal shift. Yeah, it's so interesting that you mentioned that because when we look at the types of drugs, Vern, that are out there, and of course you do alcohol as well, but when we look at this fentanyl situation, it seems to me when I look at it and I, I see the reports that the, that the downward fall from taking these opiates and especially this type of opiate, artificial opiate, can be very rapid and can almost be instantaneous for the, for the user. But at the same time, when I think about what it takes to, to kind of move back up and become a, you know, a powerful member of society, that's a long way to get up. So it's a fast fall, but maybe a long way to get up. Is that what you're seeing on your end of things? Well, of course, yes. But the other thing to think about with fentanyl is they mix fentanyl into the other drugs, into methamphetamine, into heroin, you know, even into marijuana. And people don't know what's there. And it is strong. It is strong. And it is, it is a wicked drug. And it's cheap and it's available and people don't know how to use it. And they, and they die by accident. Wow. Because Crazy. they overdose. Wow. And, you know, um, numbers of overdoses are, are increasing and we're just, we're still in a crisis. You know, people thought this opioid crisis was going to go away. Well, it's not. And it is a bipartisan issue, which is another thing our governors are talking about here. 
um, is, you know, both sides should come together and create legislation and, and create, you know, our challenge is, you know, how long it takes to bring beds online, you know? And so helping us with some of those challenges is, is what we're really fighting for now. Yeah, you're on quite the journey, Vern. Let's talk about it. You know, you're the owner. Uh, you've got a great management team, a great staff. You have three locations soon to break another one open for, for helping so many people. When we look at someone like you, how important is it for you to sort of get your feet on the ground and go through the facilities and meet some people and see what's going on? In other words, you know, is it important for you to sort of have feet on the ground at the facility so you can understand what's happening sort of frontline? Not as much as I originally, I mean, I, I tell the story of, you know, originally we got this big contract from the state and I showed, and I had to feed 50 people <laughs> first week. And I would, took my car and just went to the grocery store, got as many groceries as I could. And we all just cooked. And, you know, I mean, from there, but now I have such a strong team of executive directors that run the specific facilities and of um, a great corporate team, a great C-suite. But I find the beauty in me just doing the drop-in. I like to do the drop-in. I learn so much and I talk to the clients. And if I'm ever having a bad day, I just have to swing by our facility that's just down the street from our office. And let me tell you, I'm going to have a good day by the time I walk out of there because those guys are so thankful that we're there helping them and changing their lives. It is just the most exciting thing I can, I can imagine. I love it, Vern. Of course, I want to have you give back to the entrepreneur community in a moment. And thank you so much for cutting out some time for us today on the dot-com magazine entrepreneur spotlight series. But before we do, I want you to put your social worker hat on for a minute. Okay. You might it's been have a while. Some people, I'll try. That's a long time ago, right? <laughs> um, but we might have some people, you know, some executive CEOs, founders, young startup founders watching the show. Maybe they know somebody, or maybe it's a son or a daughter that's having a tough time. Maybe they themselves are having a tough time as well. Mm -hmm. Can you give some type of encouragement and some type of thought from Vern Johnson's mind and experience that might be able to help them understand to reach out and get some help? Well, yeah. I mean, um, you know, as an entrepreneur providing services and creating this company, I sold commercial real estate in the afternoon and I ran the company in the morning. And that's how I got us to where we are today without bringing in investors. And that gave us the ability to build this. But if people need help, just get on our website, axiomcareofaz.com, call us. If we can't help, we will set you up with someone who can. We've been working nationally with SAMHSA to create databases Throughout the country, I was sat on a committee last year, and I think that's all going to be rolling out this year so people can just get online, find resources, get on the phone with folks, and, and get involved. And I think more and more companies are being able to work within the Medicaid process. Different states are different, but here in Arizona, we can get you on Medicaid in the facility, figure it out, and, and work with you. I like it. So oh. the help is available. Pick you up know, the phone. Yeah. You mentioned Vern early on in the entrepreneurial journey. You know, you've got the contract, you have to go make food, you're going to the stores, your left hand is cooking, your right hand is driving and, you know, having a yeah. lot of fun. Yeah. For the younger entrepreneurs watching the show, maybe they're having yeah. a tough time or maybe they're, you know, freezing in the frame a little bit. What type of advice, Vern, can you give to the younger entrepreneurs watching the show yeah. about how to get through a tough time? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think if they're wanting to get into the business, right, I think an easy point of entry is, is a 10-bed house. Now here in Arizona, you can get a 10-bed house licensed. You can have 10 clients. You can run everything yourself. And then you can come from that. That's how we started. We had a 10-bed house that my uncle bought for us, that I borrowed the money from my uncle. Now we've had since paid him off and bought out, and, you know, and, and now we're doing bigger buildings, but that's a point of entry, you know, and, uh, you know, get in there, get contacts, 
We have um, very strong relationships and I was chairman of the board of the Arizona Recovery Housing Association. They have mentorship programs for people who want to get into the business. Um, MyAzra.org, A-Z-R-H-A.org here in Arizona. And then uh, the uh, National Association of Recovery Residences. That's a good resource for folks nationally who want to get into business and serve, but also as a referral. Both of those entities help refer folks to providers. I love it, Vern. What a great recommendation for people that need a point of entry that are thinking about maybe coming into this type of space to help so many people like you've done at Axiom Care with your amazing team. And congratulations on the expansion. The next evolution of Axiom is right around the corner. You've used that technology to the highest and most efficient use. And I want to thank you so much for coming on the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you. Have a great day. 